welcome everyone and appreciate you sticking around through the afternoon. Um, Pat Kelleher couldn't make it right now, so he asked me to, to run this meeting um, to wrap up the first day of the meeting week. So as Tony said, Colleen Coogan is here from Garfo and she's going to give a presentation on the Atlantic Large Whale Take Reduction Team uh, efforts. And her presentation is going to focus on um, efforts to reduce risk to right whales in gillnet fisheries across the entire coast, as well as the uh, mixed species pot and trap fisheries, as well as the mid-Atlantic lobster fishery. So with that, I think you can jump right in, Colleen, whenever you are ready to go. Great, I'm ready. Uh, thanks so much for getting the slides up. And uh, thanks so much for having us. And sorry for keeping you uh, on a long day. Uh, a few of my team members are on the phone as well, and I'd like to thank them for their help with this. And uh, Burton Shank, who is the architect of our decision support tool that we're using for assessing risk reduction measures is also on, and I may want to call on him depending on questions later on today. Um, next slide, please. So uh, just recall that under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, we implement take reduction process when a marine mammal stock's incidental mortality or serious injury in U.S. commercial fisheries exceeds the potential biological removal level that's prescribed essentially by the act. Although the plan mitigates impacts to other Atlantic large whales, because the PBR is what we call the potential biological removal level, because that is less than one mortality or serious injury a year for right whales, the plan does focus primarily on reducing the impacts on right whales. Under the take reduction process, we work with a stakeholder group, the take reduction team to develop and recommend measures. And uh, we work towards consensus recommendations, but if they don't come to consensus, at the end of the day, NIMS is still required to implement the modifications to the plan to reduce takes to below PBR. The large whale team has 60 members, including 16 fishermen, as well as a, a ASMFC rep on the team, Tony, and um, she's backed up by Caitlin as her alternate. And there's also a member from each of your states, each of the Atlantic coastal states. The plan was first developed in 96, and it includes a lot of measures to reduce risk, including gear modifications to either reduce encounter rate or reduce the severity of encounters, as well as gear marking measures to help us better understand where incidental takes are actually occurring. But despite all that, we still are not below PBR. Uh, and um, starting in about 2017, when a paper was published that demonstrated that right whales have been in decline since 2010, but uh, accelerated in 2017. We've been working with the take reduction team to modify the take reduction plan. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you mostly about phase two, but uh, phase one were modifications that many of you are familiar with for uh, Northeast lobster and Jonah crab trap pop fisheries. And we that rule is currently in OMB. Uh, and we anticipate it could be released as early as this month. What we're talking about today is primarily uh, we are getting ready to start scoping on phase two. So uh, next slide, please. As I said, uh, starting in 2017, uh, accelerated decline in right whale numbers was documented. This uh, graphic in green, it shows the population estimates. And as you can see, the population was growing until about 2010 and then 2011 started declining slightly and that took a deep dive in 2017 when a number of mortalities were seen, particularly uh, a dozen that were seen in Canada and five in the US. Almost all the mortalities that we see uh, that are observed are caused by either entanglements or vessel strikes. We, we rarely, uh, in some cases, we don't get to a carcass or it's too decomposed to tell, but where it can be determined it's almost always an anthropogenic cause. The graphic on the lower part of this graph uh, shows the mortality estimates in that orange line and the birth, uh, documented births in the blue bars. And as you can see, since certainly uh, 2017, but really since about 2014, the mortalities have exceeded the births uh, as estimated by the population model. We had a decent birthing year this year, um, but it still has not gotten up to birth numbers that we were seeing in previous years. Next slide, please. And, you know, the issue continues to be mortalities. Uh, this is a summary of uh, what we've been seeing since 2017. 
given the large number of mortalities in 2017, an unusual mortality event was declared by NOAA. And we've always tracked right whale mortalities pretty quickly, but this gave us resources to try and get to as many of them as possible to really determine cause of death where we could. Um, in uh, 2019, the most recent population estimate for right whales was uh, about 368 whales. Only uh, fewer than 100 of those are likely breeding females. And since 2017, there have been 52 known documented mortalities and serious injuries. This is um, the you know, lowest estimate of mortalities. Uh, the estimated mortalities is much higher than that, uh, about in some years twice uh, as high as that or even a little bit higher. During that same time where we know 52 have died or been injured sufficiently to likely cause death, there have been only 40 calves born. Uh, during that same time, five serious injuries caused by entanglements were avoided because the whales were disentangled. Not all those mortalities are entanglement and not all are uh, caused by U.S. fishing gear. Um, we are have a very difficult time identifying the site of entanglements. Uh, we don't, uh, whales are not always carrying gear. Even when they are carrying gear, we are not always able to retrieve the gear. And when we do retrieve the gear, there's not always a distinguishing mark on the gear. So we rarely can identify even to a country where um, an entanglement occurred, unless the gear is very distinctive or has gear marks on them. So during this period of the 34 known mortalities, uh, 10 were first seen in the US and 24 were first seen in Canada. Nine entanglements were first seen in US and five first seen in Canada. And the rest were either vessel strikes or the cause couldn't be determined because of the state of the, of the, uh, the mortality. And there were 18 additional known serious injuries, 11 first seen in the US and four first seen in Canada. Nine of those first seen in the US uh, were entanglements, and five entanglements were first seen in Canada. Next slide, please. And this breaks down the first seen in U.S. fisheries uh, or in U.S. waters um, that were entanglements. Uh, this breaks those down a little bit further. So this is all the documented mortality and serious injuries or, or serious injuries averted first seen in U.S. waters um, since 2008. The light blue shows uh, those that were disentangled and first seen in the U.S., but we don't know the source of the gear. The gray shows serious injuries or mortalities first seen in the U.S. The dark teal, it were those were the whales that were disentangled and were carrying U.S. gear, gear identified as belonging to a U.S. fishery. The black were serious injuries or mortalities in documented U.S. gear. And uh, the white for 2021, those are two serious injuries or two cases that have been preliminarily identified as serious injuries. That data is preliminary. The red dots on this shows the potential biological removal level. It's always, uh, almost always, I think all but um, 2014 and 15 has been less than one whale per year. And as you can see on this, for every year except 2013, from what we know about animals first documented in U.S. Uh, waters as entanglement, severe, uh, serious injuries or mortalities, we've been over PBR every year except that one. Um, and this is considered to be, you know, a minimum number to some extent because we are fairly certain that the unseen uh, mortalities that are estimated by the population model are also primarily uh, mortalities caused by anthropogenic sources, including entanglement, and some portion of those would be entanglements in U.S. gear. Next slide, please. So uh, we have two rulemaking processes going on right now, uh, or one is about to be initiated. As we mentioned, the, the Northeast Lobster and Jonah Crab rule is, uh, the final rule is in OMB and review. The environmental impact statement was released July 2nd, 2021, and today is the last day of the cooling off period for that. Uh, I know they have another listing session in OMB next week, and I don't know if others will be scheduled as well, but we are hoping to get that rule out um, this month, and we anticipate completing the record of decision sometime in the next week or two, depending on uh, what comes in through the OMB listing sessions. 
We are now just initiating the coastwide rulemaking for the phase two um, rulemaking effort. And that is for all those fisheries that are currently managed under the take reduction plan that are uh, were not uh, modified in the rule that just is almost coming out. So the, we have the notice of intent ready to go. We're hoping to get that published within the next week or two, and that will kick off our public scoping period. We're going for at least a 45 day period, hoping to encompass your next uh, Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission meeting in October, as well as uh, council meetings for each of the Atlantic Coastal Councils. Uh, and then uh, we will, during that time, be hosting uh, regional meetings and probably holding some listening sessions where we have an open phone line all day so that people can call in. Uh, then we will be meeting with the TRT uh, through a combination of webinars and in-person meetings over the next few months. We want to bring them the results of the scoping, get some ideas from them for further analysis. And somewhere around uh, late winter or early spring, we hope, to work with them to get recommendations based on the analyses and the scoping. And uh, those would be recommendations that we think would support the next effort for a proposed rule and a draft environmental impact statement. We would hope to come out with the proposed rule and draft environmental impact statement for uh, public comments sometime next year, perhaps late summer, early fall of next year. And we hope to have final rulemaking in 2023. Next slide, please. So as I to told you in the update, um, the current rule is focused on Northeast lobster and Jonah crab trap pot fisheries. We uh, let the team know that we believe the 60 to 80% risk reduction was required to, to get those the uh, serious injury and mortality in those fisheries uh, to below PBR. The 80% number is based on the estimated mortality and some assumptions that were made about what portion could be caused by U.S. fisheries. The 60% uh, reduction was a target that was based on what we know from documented mortalities. We uh, released the FEIS July 2nd, the cooling off period ends today, and the final rules in OMB, as I already said. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is our timeline for modifications uh, for phase two, where we're looking at those fisheries not modified on that first rulemaking. So that is the Mid-Atlantic lobster and Jonah crab fisheries, Mid-Atlantic mixed, I'm sorry, coastwide mixed species trap pot fisheries and coastwide gillnet fisheries. We've been already working with the team to improve and expand the decision support tool. Uh, the team brainstormed some ideas that we'll be including in scoping and that are a few slides down, we'll be getting to those. The notice of intent, we, we uh, hope to get published shortly so we can start the formal EIS scoping process. And uh, we anticipate at least a 45 day comment period for that. And we'll be meeting with the TRT uh, a number of times through webinars and at least twice through full team meetings. Uh, they may be hybrid. We're hoping that second meeting can be in person to help the team develop what we hope will be consensus recommendations that we can use for proposed rulemaking. This is a little bit different than the way we did it last time where the scoping was done after the TRT meeting. Our hope is that we and any states that want to do scoping will have all that scoping done up front and the TRT will get the benefits of that scoping before they uh, draft recommendations for us and come to consensus. And again, we're hoping that that final EIS and final rule will come out sometime in 2023. Next slide, please. So our goals for this, uh, we are continuing to shoot for a 60 to 80% risk reduction uh, in all U.S. commercial fisheries combined. So the modifications we'd be looking at this time would be for the Atlantic gillnet fisheries the Atlantic mixed species trap pot and the mid-Atlantic lobster and Jonah crab fisheries. And um, we have in our meetings that we've started so far, started to look at some of the baseline fishery and whale distribution data and develop more information on risk and how risk will inform the decision support tool. And we've developed some of the ideas that we're bringing out to scoping. Next slide, please. 
These are the many fisheries regulated under uh, by the ASMFC or by the Atlantic states that are currently managed through some of our regulations under the take reduction plan and that would be considered pretty much on the table for next plan modifications. Um, again, all the gillnet fisheries, the mixed trap fisheries, and um, uh, the mid-Atlantic Jonah crab and um, lobster fisheries. So we are you know, looking for improved information from the states, uh, interested in getting feedback on the decision support tool, as we've already gotten some of that from uh, your, your TRT members. And um, we may continue to go out to ask for more information about your fisheries. The decision support tool team has been doing that already, and we really do appreciate all the help we've been getting from the states, making sure we have the best information possible in the decision support tool. Next slide, please. These are some uh, graphics put together for the team to try and give them an idea of where risk appears to be. So these are the hotspot analyses. These are for co coastwide uh, hotspot analysis. So um, although the images I'm showing you will be by region, this uh, uh, the, the color you can see on this slide represents where uh, the top 60% of the risk uh, within these fisheries occurs coastwide. So for, for the Gulf of Maine, uh, we see some in uh, in May, well, to follow these, they go uh, month by month, starting in the upper left with January and ending in the lower right with December. The one on the left shows trap pot fisheries. We see a hot spot in the um, southern um, Cape Cod Bay. That the data in our in the model includes whale data from 2010 to 2018. That hot spot may reflect the years prior to Massachusetts closures of those waters if whales are still there. So we believe that hot spot may have been ameliorated by existing uh, state measures and the state actually created the, uh, made those measures permanent so that those waters are now closed through May 15th and they can expand that to the end of May if whales stay in the area. If you look at uh, Gulf of Maine gillnet hotspots, we really don't see uh, major air concentrated areas of hotspots. There are, uh, co there's color showing up on the border of, I believe that's uh, area 512, uh, 513, I'm sorry, and 515 on the border of those two NIMS statist statistical areas uh, and, in, and in 515. Um, so that is where the risk appears to be for the Gulf of Maine. Next slide, please. And looking at it for southern New England, uh, the top the top images are for the gillnet fisheries, and you can see that uh, southern Long Island and south of the islands, uh, Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, Block Island, is where we're seeing hot spots. Really, December through May, with a little bit of color showing up in June and November as well. In the for trap pot fisheries. Uh, we're seeing a little bit similar uh, in um, southern Long Island in April. A hotspot shows up. Uh, southern Islands, November, December, we're seeing a little bit close to the, uh, the coast of Rhode Island and uh, Massachusetts. Next slide, please. And for the mid-Atlantic, further south, uh, I think what we're seeing here is sort of the the uh, some of the whales that seem to stay in the mid-Atlantic off of Delaware, New Jersey, and maybe Hatteras while calving is going on, and we're seeing the return of the calving uh, cow-calf pairs uh, in um, in l later in the winter. So we see hot spots really from December through April. Uh, but it seems to be a more of a moving hotspot with a pretty broad range of hotspots in January, concentrated around Hatteras in February and March, and um, then moving north in April. Next slide, please. 
the southeast uh honestly we can't find a lot of hot spots in the southeast right now they have pretty rigorously put in some protective measures because uh, when the whales are there they're there with calves so they're more vulnerable the cows and calves are more vulnerable um, so we don't find hot spots in the top 60 percent of risk reduction coastwide um, we do uh, when we first ran these analyses with the preliminary model we did not have all of the state fisheries data so this is being updated now and uh, may may modify before we go out fully for scoping next slide please the scoping ideas that were brainstormed with the team and these do not represent uh, any consensus we were not asking for consensus the goal with the team so far and the goal for scoping is to get as many good ideas out there as possible and try and analyze them as well as possible before the team has to develop any recommendations for us. So what we uh, had uh, identified as ideas to consider and to take after scoping for gillnet fishing included things like reducing soak times. In some fisheries, there was a suggestion of restricting overnight soaks. Uh, for fisheries that had some effort management, including gear limitations already in place, uh, identifying minimum and maximum numbers of nets on string that was towards reducing the number of end lines. Uh, there was also discussion evaluating the use of tie downs for some fisheries, and that is to reduce the uh, amount of water column the, the panel uh, is taking up so that there's a lower encounter risk in the water column. And uh, for some gillnet, fisheries, there was a request to get ideas about the possibility of ropeless gillnet on one end, a hybrid fishery with a buoy on one end and ropeless on the other end. Next slide, please. And for trap pot gear, uh, we heard things similar to what we uh, had proposed in our ongoing rulemaking effort, increasing the number of traps between uh, buoy lines to reduce the number of buoy lines. This was not recommended for the southeast calving area. Again, they've got uh, calves that are more vulnerable to a lighter weight gear. So in the southeast, they want to retain their singles only requirements with very weak line. Um, for uh, a trap caps were identified for any fisheries that don't have a cap, that don't have effort limitation or have a lot of latent uh, effort. And that includes fish, pots, blue crab and whelk fisheries. Uh, and then there was uh, a request for us, and we will analyze an extension of the same kind of measures that will be in our final rule um, from our phase one efforts to other trap fisheries across the area. Because the rule hasn't been, uh, isn't out yet and could always could still change, we haven't actually done that analysis yet. Next slide, please. Uh, we also discussed uh, restricted area for risk reduction. A lot of the um, risk reduction in our analyzed in our final environmental impact statement was really coming from seasonal restricted areas that reduce co-occurrence between the whales and the line. Uh, they have to be very carefully created and considered because you don't want to push effort into areas of high whale abundance. But um, that is something that was still on the table with the take reduction team is something to be brainstormed. If we uh, included in that is reevaluating our existing restricted areas, allowing ropeless testing. The Southeast Black Sea Bass Fisheries is particularly interested in doing that. They're already doing some of that testing now, and they would like that to provide them with access to the large area that's already closed to Black Sea Bass trap pot fishing. Uh, they, uh, there was some cons some uh, interest in reevaluating the existing boundaries and timing of our seasonal restricted areas and in taking the black sea bass closures that are currently regulated by the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council and adopting those into the um, take reduction plan itself. And then there was a request that we analyze new areas based on hot spots. There was a suggestion to look at rolling areas that uh, close areas rolling up and down with the cow-calf pairs as they migrate south and north. Um, and then um, the southern New England area that looks pretty hot on this slide um, would be another area that they want us to analyze as a seasonal restricted area. Next slide, please. 
And then we would look at uh, gear marking and amplifying existing gear marking requirements. Uh, some of those are currently seasonal, but we know there's year-round presence of right whales in the mid-Atlantic, so those would perhaps become year-round. Uh, they're uh, in the Northeast states. They were interested in differentiating between states, so we will uh, likely be implementing a change in the colors currently required uh, in, in Northeast states using their uh, home ports, or I think it was principal port as identified on their permit. Uh, we uh, are looking at differentiating between state and federal waters, differentiating better between US and Canada. Canada right now has a six inch gear marking requirement. We're interested in expanding our gear marks to no less than a foot so that we don't have, uh, you know, kind of muddle the interpretation of any gear marks we do find. And then we might look at different colors for different gear types or different color patterns. Next slide, please. So a number of those uh, uh, ideas that have been discussed would be hard for us to analyze without a really good understanding of latent effort, and of fishery management plans in place or being planned, um, particularly the suggestion that we cap latent effort in gillnet fisheries, that's something that if the councils or the states or the commission are already planning to do that, uh, that we can consider their plans in developing our own planning. Um, there was a real push for making sure that any of these fisheries are already limited entry if they're open access, then any effort management that we're doing indirectly through our gear modifications, would not, we would not be able to demonstrate that they could be effective. Um, we have real challenges determining the amount of effort and managing some of the unmanaged fisheries. And so any input from the states or the commission on those uh, would be really appreciated on how we can uh, identify what effort is there, what uh, what we anticipate in the near future and uh, suggestions on how we could restrict increasing gear or actually implement measures to decrease the amount of gear out there. Again, trap caps were proposed. Reducing soap times would be very hard to evaluate if we're not also limiting the amount of gear that could be added to a fishery. And then um, discussions of the number of nets on a string between buoy lines is something else that would be difficult to evaluate if the overall effort is not already being reduced. So that's a kind of input we would really love to get from all of our fishery manager, managers. Next slide, please. Um, right now, 1,700 pounds has been identified as a breaking strength that could be used to reduce injury if a whale is uh, entangled, and that is what was proposed in our rule in, and it was proposed in the manner, just uh, two different ways were proposed. One is full weak rope, which, which is engineered weak rope, or every 40 to 60 feet, a weak insertion would be put in the line. And the other, which was proposed by some of the states in the Northeast, would be the top half would be weak and weakened by a, a weak insertion put in 50% down, and another one about a quarter of the way down, so two weak insertions or in another uh, option we're looking at for the other rule is 30% down. So we would be interested in getting input on thoughts about weak rope, uh, the strength of rope needed to retrieve gear, and what could be tolerated in some of the different fisheries. Uh, there's a suggestion to cap the line diameter at a half inch to differentiate it from Canadian gear, which is particularly for the snow crab and the offshore lobster fishery, it's about five eighths of an inch. Uh, we've been asked to consider the gear modifications that we will be requiring and expanding those year round in the mid-Atlantic. And um, in the Southeast, a fisherman suggested that we could, we could uh, require weaker inserts and they're currently required to have by also pairing that with a smaller anchor. For some of those coastal fisheries, they don't believe that they need an anchor as large as the one that's currently in place. Next slide, please. So uh, as I said, we're initiating formal scoping and we will still be in scoping when you meet again. So we would be very interested in getting uh, input from you at the next ASMFC meeting if that if you're interested in providing us with input. Uh, we're really particularly interested from you in getting input on the fisheries that you manage 
and some of the state managed fisheries like the whelk fisheries. Um, particularly where we have trouble characterizing latent effort and uh, any access issues for this, particularly those that are not limited access. Um, we'll be scoping during September and October. Right now we're planning seven region specific meetings. Uh, so Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, Southeast, uh, possibly Southern New England. We may hold them by gillnet versus trap pot meetings separately. And if any states are going to be doing their own scoping, which did happen in the Northeast states, we would be happy to support state scoping. We can uh, partner in the scoping or we can just be there to answer questions uh, if that's at all useful. And we can also potentially, depending on our uh, capacity, um, we could potentially run some analyses for states to take out the scoping uh, once the decision support tool updates have been completed, which we hope to have by early November. And uh, then our after scoping, our plan is to bring the results of that scoping back to the team to have them kind of initiate their discussions of uh, further ideas for us to analyze, and then ultimately, hopefully in March of next year, uh, for them to actually develop recommendations in what we hope will be an in-person meeting in March 2022. Next slide, please. I think that's everything. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them or to share them with Burton. Great, thanks, Colleen. Appreciate the uh, great presentation, very helpful. And uh, this is Bob Beal. I should have introduced myself at the beginning and not assumed you you knew my voice, Colleen. But, but thanks, um, Bob, it's hard when we can't see you. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to remember. Um, so great, I'll, I'll uh, do a little crowd control, Colleen, at, here and, and see who has their hands up and, and send the questions your way um, as we get going here. So anyone with questions, please go ahead and raise your hands. I don't see any hands up. Tony, do you? Sorry, the hand thing was in my way. I don't see any hands currently, Bob. All right. Colin, you may be getting off easy. You and Burton. Wait, Kim McCowan has her hand up. Please go ahead, Kim. Hi, Kim. Can't hear you, Kim. Kim, it looks like you're still muted on, on your end. There you go. Nope. Sure. I was just wondering, Colleen, would you be able to make this presentation available? Yes. Uh, we also probably will do what we did for our last scoping session and um, and record our scoping uh, like a big scoping presentation um, and I post that on the TRT website. But we can share these slides, yes. Thanks, that'd be helpful. Great, thanks. The next hand up is Chris Spatsavage from North Carolina. Chris, I think you're muted as well. He's muted by the organizer. One sec, there we go. Okay, um, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, you're good now. Okay, yeah, thanks. And uh, th thanks for the presentation, Colleen. Um, on the, uh, for the gillnet fisheries, uh, you, know, you mentioned the different species that are targeted uh, along the coast, uh, both uh, interstate uh, council managed and, uh, and state managed uh, fisheries and you know it's, it's it's hard to capture every every species along the coast I think he captured most of them but maybe not all of them uh, is as far as scoping goes is there um, uh, any uh, would it make sense to uh, maybe categorize the gillnet fisheries by by mesh sizes to make sure you're covering all the fisheries as opposed to listing each species individually I think I think something something like that was done uh, with the uh, bottomless dolphin take reduction uh, plan, 
uh, where they looked at, you know, mesh sizes less than five inches and then five to seven inches and greater than seven inches. I didn't know if that was something that the, uh, the, the TRT discussed when we put this together. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, good question. And um, right now, uh, Kevin Mork and Greg DiDomenico are doing a good job uh, providing some granular information to us on uh, ways to consider the gillnet fisheries and the variety along the coast. Um, I, I think mesh sizes is a great way to do it. Uh, uh, grouping them by uh, fishing gear rather than target species, particularly as species start to move. So a fisherman may not always know what their target species is the day they go out because uh, it might be what they encounter. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense and that's definitely something that we could consider and maybe even add that to our scoping list of things to get input on. Great, the next hand is David Borden. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and Colleen, in terms of dealing with latent effort, has NOAA had a discussion about how to handle fisheries where there are no FMPs, uh, either federal or state? Wave whelk, for instance. Um, how, how how do we go about capping effort uh, in a fishery like that? So I'm asking the ASMFC and the states that question, Dave. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, where, I, I don't know it. if you want to have any input, but I think that is a it's a real problem for us for the unmanaged fisheries, um, and uh, you know it, it's also a problem where there's not limited access, which may only be the skate fisheries, but that's going to also be a real challenge. Well, I, and I asked uh, the question not to put you on the spot, but as you know, the New England Council voted to not proceed with limited access on skates. Uh, so that that's a fishery that uh, comes to mind. The wave whelk fishery, no one has, as far as I'm uh, knowledgeable. Nobody has a FMP on wave well. It's not like there's a federal permit that's required. It just somebody at some point I think has to think through how how we handle those. They're primarily federal fisheries. Um, so that's my comment. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thanks, David. Any other hands? I don't see any more up on our on my end no not seeing any well with that colleen you know thanks again for the the presentation and you know letting everyone know the process and and all the additional you know public input and and um opportunities as well as signs we'll be checking back with the commission and trt meetings and everything else that's going to be going on it's a it's going to be a busy year or a year and a half however long it takes so I uh, just want to thank you for your presentation and all of your hard work. And if there's any way the commission can help with this process, you know, we can we can provide time during our meeting weeks as we as we have done today. So just let us know. Great. Thanks much for the opportunity. And uh, I see a number of TRT members on here, some of the state reps. Thank you all for all the work you've done so far this year. And um, shout out to Tony and Caitlin for the help that they've already provided. Really appreciate it. And really, anybody, we are looking for input. Uh, and at this point, we are in the brainstorming stage, so we welcome any any input. Thank you. Excellent. Well, I think with that, I think we are done for the day. So um, we will call it a day and regroup in the morning. So thanks, uh, all of you, for your hard work today, and we'll talk to you tomorrow.